we came into this year, uh, levels of overvaluation of the U.S. dollar and of the U.S. Treasury market of somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. So I think the first thing is if you look at 10-year uh, Treasuries in the U.S., uh, three and a three and a half percent yields. I think are pretty certain this year. Uh, four is a is, a, is a, a pretty clear possibility. U.S. dollar is vulnerable because part of this move. Uh, of, the, of the term premium adjusting is actually money leaving the US. Europe is the big problem, and Europe is the big problem because where it's starting from. Henry Kaufman uh, taught us all how the world worked uh, back in the mid 80s. Uh, for those of you that want to learn about it, just go and read Henry's books. Excellent book, The New Financial World, published in 1986. I learned an awful lot from that. It was very different. Didn't have GDP forecasts. Uh, Salomon and Brothers didn't excel at that. They didn't do that sort of thing. They understood flows, and that's how the world worked. I think almost certainly. Absolutely. I mean, basically, you're looking at fixed income markets worldwide that are the most unusually or exceptionally valued that I can remember in 20 years. Well, the, the real reason is a, is a wonkish answer, which is something called term premium. And term premium are the way that you value fixed income markets. Uh, and to put, give you an example, I mean, basically, if you're looking at the U.S. Treasury market, the term premium actually, is actually negative right now. Now, that is such an unusual phenomenon, it's, it's remarkable. It's like looking at a 100 times P multiple on the S&P. This doesn't happen very often. Basically, if you look at the fixed income markets, uh, fixed income yields in the US are pretty much discounting what the FOMC is planning for rates in terms of the projections, short-term rates, policy rates. Uh, it's, it's term premium, which are lagging very clearly. And term premium are all about supply and demand. I think the first thing is if you look at 10-year uh, treasuries in the US, uh, three and a three and a half percent yields. I think are pretty certain this year. Uh, four is a is, a, is a, a, a pretty clear possibility. In terms of will the curve steepen or flatten, I think it's now in a, in a steepening mode. And if you look around the world, I mean, the, the U.S. is actually lagging other markets. Look at China, look at the Eurozone. Uh, curves are steepening there. And the U it's a, just a question of time before the Treasury market begins to steepen. Uh, the curve steepens. And the reason for that is that if you look at the impact that term premia have, they have a much more dramatic impact on the long end of the market than the short end. So if you get term premia rising, the curve automatically steepens. I think there's a very good case for that, but I mean, even taking that into account, I mean, normally you would expect on the on the U.S. 10-year bond a term premium of something like 100, maybe 150 basis points at the 10-year level. Uh, as I said, we're now negative, circa 2550. Uh, so you could quite a long way to climb. And even if you made some allowance for your point, which is an extremely valid and very true one, there is a lot of demand for these savings products. I still think you can go positive on the term premium and you could easily get to plus 50 basis points. Now that would still be a 75 basis point climb on yields from where we are now. The most important price in world financial markets is the yield on the US Treasury bond. Uh, if that starts to move up, everything else will begin to sell off. And I think you can look at that in a number of channels. You can look at that in equities, which I think the, the, the big U.S. stocks, the big stable demand stocks are clearly vulnerable. They've benefited hugely from uh, the, the rally in the Treasury market in the last few years. Um, U.S. dollar is vulnerable because part of this move uh, of, the, of the term premium adjusting is actually money leaving the U.S. Um, so I think that we're, we came into this year uh, levels of overvaluation of the U.S. dollar and of the U.S. Treasury market of somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, and we're in the process of correcting. Uh, one would suspect, uh, realistically, if yields start to back up to that degree, markets would be spooked. Absolutely. I mean, there will be a move back to safety. That's a, that's a real possibility. Uh, will it happen? I don't know. Could it happen? Absolutely. What time frame? I think the time frame is really about uh, I think it starts this year. We've started to see yields back up. Uh, it's very unusual to see term premium remain negative in the fixed income markets for 
anything more than about 12 months. I mean, in fact, the evidence the evidence is very slim anyway. They go negative. So uh, we would think there'll be mean, there's normally mean reversion within a maybe a 12, 18 month period. So one would have to expect that term premium begin to rise. And as I said, the reason that you've got term premium so negative is that the demand for US safe assets in the last three to four years has been absolutely unprecedented for two anomalous reasons, Xi Jinping's anti-corruption drive and Draghi's excessively loose monetary policy in the Eurozone. Both seem to be, for their own reasons, ending. But I think if you look globally, I mean, curiously, the one safer area of the world is, is the emerging markets. And it's the emerging markets because the emerging markets are now increasingly driven by China. Um, the People's Bank of China is now the biggest and arguably the most important central bank in the world. But, you know, sadly, few people watch it. Uh, what they're doing is very, is very important and it's very interesting. And the People's Bank of China, despite a little bit of a, of a step down in January, look as if they're continuing to ease monetary policy. And this is all part of their longer term vision, call it a geopolitical vision, uh, which is basically expanding the, uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, right across Central Asia. Why should China tighten this year? I see no reasons why it should. Inflation's under control. The yuan is pretty firm. Uh, the, the shadow banking system, which was arguably out of control 18 months ago, has been brought back into line. I uh, can't be any, any reason why they want to tighten. And they need the People's Bank to continue to open the monetary spigots to essentially fund the policy banks which are financing the Belt and Road Initiative. So China will continue to ease. That is a, well, will be a great fillip for the emerging market economies. Uh, it's clearly wrong for me to suggest there will be no reaction if, the, if Wall Street sells off. But I think the question is, how quickly will they rebound? And we've seen in this recent correction that emerging markets have actually come back quite quickly. Europe is the big problem. And Europe is the big problem because where it's starting from. And what people maybe don't accept is that the euro is radically undervalued, or let's say the, 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 the Deutschmark is radically undervalued. Uh, let's call it that. Uh, and basically what you've got is that uh, you know, why are you not getting adjustment? Because basically the Deutsche Mark is part of a Euro area where effectively the pressures on Germany are spread across the Euro region. Now, that means that it's Italy, it's Greece, it's Spain that tries to compensate for the German problem. And if you look at Germany's trade surplus, then you realize the scale of the issues that are facing the world economy. Now, this is unsustainable. And the real problem is, uh, is the adjustment of the currency. Now, if, we've, if we're correct and the dollar goes down, and if we're correct and the yen doesn't go down, then the dollar has to correct or has to move against something. And the big currency it moves against is the euro. Now, if you start to get an adequate adjustment of the euro, and let's say the euro goes to perhaps 130, 135 on a cross rate against the dollar, what sort of pain is that going to impart on the periphery economic areas of the Eurozone, I think pretty enormous. So I think it's not impossible to start to revisit a lot of these debt concerns about Europe once again, and for the whole debate about is this a viable economic mechanism, uh, will just basically be uh, a, an issue which will be live. People will have to start discussing whether there is an adequate uh, fiscal transfer mechanisms in Europe to basically save Italy, Greece, Spain yet again. I think China is certainly uh, exporting monetary inflation, yes. I mean, whether it's coming through in terms of cost levels yet may be a moot point, but in terms of monetary inflation, there's no question about that. And I think that you've, you've got to see this in the context of capital flows. And, you know, my, my background uh, originated at, at Salomon Brothers. Uh, Salomon Brothers basically pioneered the use of flow of funds analysis under Henry Kaufman. It's the way that the world works. It's the way you understood the world in the 1980s and 1990s. It's the way you understand the world now. You should do. And basically what the problem has been is that the world economy is out of step. Now that's not a popular view. Uh, most people, most economists say that everything is synchronized. Uh, unfortunately it's not. What you've got is three very different cycles. You've got the US which is late cycle. You've got Europe which is mid cycle. And you've got Asia which is early cycle and capital is shifting out of the US in search of economic acceleration. It's as plain as that. Now, the starting point is an interesting one, and the starting point is to basically say, how come the two most important assets in the world, the US Treasury market and the US dollar, are so overvalued? 
And the reason being is that three to four years ago, America was the only game in town. It was the first economy to recover. It was the safe asset haven. And what you saw was a lot of money leaving China. In fact, one and a half trillion dollars uh, left China uh, when the, the President Z decided to push on the anti-corruption drive. That money went into US dollars, into US treasuries and the US currency. And then equally, Draghi's, perhaps one would argue, rather reckless monetary policy in Europe, where he's flooded the system with euros, we reckon that something like 50 cents in every euro has left the eurozone and gone into US assets. Now, that equally has gone into US treasuries and the US dollar, so we're talking here at least $3 trillion, which have basically pushed up US markets. Now, that's the starting point. And the question is, is that money going to stick around? US safe assets consequently are overvalued. Uh, they were of value coming into this year. That money is now starting to leave. So the weakness in the dollar is giving us a heads up to say that money is on the move. It's starting to shift back. And what you're seeing globally right now is that money is leaving the dollar area. It is going into Europe where policymakers are letting it push up currencies. They are not monetizing the effect at all. So it's going into the euro, into sterling, for example. Those currencies are surprising people on the upside. It is consequently damaging the stock markets in Europe. So they pretty much flatlined at best since the dollar began to weaken. And equally, money is flowing to Asia and China, where it is being monetized by the central banks. And therefore, it is creating an asset bubble in these economies. And you can see that very obviously. Look at the tech stocks in Asia. Tech stocks are a wonderful barometer of excess liquidity, and they've been flying. That's the $64,000 question, will they be disorderly? Uh, in 1987, they were disorderly, and that's what caused the, cra the, the crash. Uh, the question is, will they be disorderly this time? And one of the things we've all got to look at pretty closely are the pronouncements of the administration and basically what happens to the, to the US dollar. Uh, is it going to be an orderly decline? Now, I think one surmises um, that maybe the administration would like to see uh, the US currency lower. Now, they can, how do they do that? They can use open mouth operations, which they seem to be doing quite successfully. But what you don't want for the big Forex managers worldwide, the people that hold substantial dollars in uh, foreign exchange reserve holders, uh, to basically shift out of the dollar very suddenly. And that would cause a major uh, you know, uh, drop in the dollar, uh, an air pocket, in fact. And that's what we don't want, because then you'd see a panic worldwide. So I think that's, that's one of the first things to think about. On the question of central bank QE, uh, clearly, it would be wrong to me to say that uh, that this is uh, helpful. I mean, if the central banks are withdrawing liquidity, clearly it's very unhelpful. But the scale of the numbers are nothing like the capital flows. Capital flows, we're talking of $3 trillion at least leaving the US over maybe an 18-month period. Federal Reserve this year, maybe at most, will take out $400 billion. So it's a scale factor different. I mean, it's uh, eight times different. <laughs> I think you'd really differentiate them in terms of speed and sort of how flaky those flows are. So I think from that perspective, you, you can argue that, uh, you know, perhaps some of the Asian flows may be rather faster. Uh, and if they do see economic acceleration uh, in the case of China or the emerging markets, it'll move back rather, rather faster. I think the other thing to say is that let's look more deeply at the type of liquidity overall that shapes the world economy. And broadly speaking, we put that into three buckets. So we look at central bank liquidity, we look at the cross-border flow numbers, and then we look at private sector liquidity. Now, the big change in the US uh, is actually in that third category, private sector liquidity. And the reason that that's changed so much is that, again, if you look at the business cycle and you revert back three to four years uh, to, let's say, 2012-13, US corporations were generating huge amounts of cash. As we know, they were not investing it in capital equipment. They were leaving it in treasury. And basically, they were not putting it in banks because actually that's what corporations don't do. They were putting it in wholesale money markets. A lot of those wholesale money markets were offshore, the so-called euro dollar markets. And the leverage that comes out of the euro dollar markets in terms of global liquidity and global credit flows is vast. And it was that pool of money that was driving a lot of the liquidity uh, globally. Now, what we've seen in the course of the last uh, probably 12 to 18 months, is that that cash flow from US corporations has begun to slow markedly. And the inflows into the euro dollar markets have slowed markedly. And that's one of the factors that is at risk. Now, that's another factor which is weighing on markets. Now, for the moment, that's not biting, but it could be an issue, let's say, out there in the next year or so.
But I think that, you know, ultimately our view is that for the moment what you're going to see is outperformance from the Asian markets and the commodity producers. And that really rests on, to a large extent, as I said, what the People's Bank of China is doing. And ultimately in Asia, or for the emerging markets, you have two engines currently running. One is the People's Bank. And as I keep stressing, this is big and it's very important. And we've all got to watch what the People's Bank does, spend rather more time on the People's Bank than on the FOMC in the US. And the second thing is that regional central banks across Asia are basically beginning, or they, they are monetizing the capital inflows. So those are two very important engines. Now, there's one other element that we need to throw into this, which is a very important point right now, and that is what is happening in Japan. And in Japan, we detect there is a major change in monetary policy going on. Now, that major change is basically realigning Japan, or aligning Japan, perhaps is the more accurate way of putting it, with the rest of Asia. And the reason for saying that is that for much of the last 20 years, the BOJ, the Bank of Japan, effectively operated uh, a policy whereby they targeted liquidity in the financial markets. Now, we can debate you know, for hours, if you like, about whether this was the correct level of liquidity to target, but that's what they were doing. And effectively, the yen was the factor that moved to adjust things. Now, given the fact that they held liquidity tight, the yen was typically a strong currency. And that was the shadow that effectively hung over the Asian business cycle. Whenever Asia picked up, the yen strengthened, and that basically tended to thwart the cycle. What you've got going in now is a very different scenario. It looks to us as if the Japanese have switched policy to targeting the yen. The yen, in the last 12 months, has barely moved against its peer currencies in the US dollar. And that is the, the Sherlock Holmes story of the famous dog that didn't bark. Uh, as long as I've been in financial markets, when the dollar's weakened, the yen has been one of the primary beneficiaries. Not so this time. Something very odd is going on. And we think it's because of a change in policy. Now, if this is correct, what you've got is Japan likely joining in the same Asian cycle. Uh, Japan will be there too. And this is clearly very good news for Abe in Japan because his reforms will suddenly start to win through strongly. So in our view, Japan looks a cheap stock market in a global context. It's a big stock market. Uh, it's very tuned into the China uh, supply chains. Uh, if you believe that China is the future, which we do, um, in, a, in, in a reality sense, it is the future, uh, you will see very good performance coming out of the Japanese stock market. If you look at the fixed income markets, uh, the shape of the Japanese yield curve is so unusual. Uh, this is like sort of seeing Elvis mount on top of the, of the Loch Ness monster. Uh, it just doesn't happen. Uh, it, it, it will have to break. And ultimately, you will see the, the, the Japanese 10-year bond uh, substantially, the yield substantially higher than where we are now. Asian financials look, you know, prime in this environment. Uh, the yield curve in China is steepening. Um, credit growth in China is still pretty healthy. Uh, bank profit margins look as if they're going up. The yield curve in Japan has got to steepen. Bank profit margins will go up. I think Asian financials are extremely well placed in this environment. Well, I think the thing that China has to worry about, I mean, you're, you're right, inflation is a key issue. We know from the past Tiananmen Square example, uh, it was inflation pressures that started to cause that unrest. So I think that's clearly something that is, is paramount. But I think the other question is that what China, what the party has to deliver in China, the Communist Party, uh, basically has to deliver rising real incomes. And it's really as simple as that. If they fail to do that, then there's a serious problem. If they deliver, then it's, it works wonderfully. And that is what Xi Jinping is, after all, trying to do. He's trying not to make the mistakes uh, that occurred in the Soviet Union, which effectively was undermining the party. Uh, what he's trying to do is basically to roll out the economic machine under the control of a party where corruption is basically sat upon, uh, which he seems to have done very successfully so far, where there are the excesses of the shadow banking system don't exist. There's not speculation in real estate, and effectively everyone is focused on economic growth. And that seems to be a model that's working. And therefore, we think that uh, the One Belt, One Road, or Belt and Road Initiative, call it what you like, is the future both for, uh, for Asia, for Eurasia, and for China itself. And ultimately, all the hopes or maybe the uh, the pronouncements of many economists that say that China is switching its economic model from capital spending towards consumer spending. Uh, it's a nice idea. So it happens that every five-year plan that I've looked at in the last, I think, 20 years has made the same pronouncements about the aspirations of consumer spending, but it doesn't really happen. 
what they, they, they can't switch that easily. What they've got to do is to effectively roll out the capital spending machine, which means pushing the frontiers of China into Eurasia, and that's the model they're doing. Infrastructure spending, you know, the, the Beijing consensus, if that's what one wants to call it, has replaced the Washington consensus. And it's all about an infrastructure development model. To what extent is a growth rate of maybe six to seven percent sustainable in the medium term? Well, I would suggest if you go back and look at the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, when it was actually growing at a sustainable rate, that's the benchmark to take. The problem the Soviet Union got into was in the early 1970s, where they decided they were going to shift from capital goods production towards consumer goods con consumption uh, production. And that is when the economy derailed. And that was the problem. Um, now, I think that that is a, an issue that China could face if it decided to go down the route of more consumer goods, uh, because that's where, let's say, a planned economy doesn't work very well. If you're producing steel and you're producing roads and you're producing bridges, uh, it's very easy to corral economic resources into what are relatively simple functions uh, in a planned economy framework and deliver growth. And that's what China is best suited to do, and that's what it's doing across Central Asia. Now, the next question in that whole uh, economic model is, how is it financed? And the answer is, it's going to be financed through the People's Bank or through the policy banks, and look at these various institutions like the Asian Investment uh, Bank, uh, etc., the infrastructure banks. All these various uh, bodies are, broadly speaking, financing the Belt and Road Initiative. And for those people that, you know, say it's fanciful, I mean, just go out there and look. It's happening. It's before our eyes. This is the reality. And broadly, the main factor, the main vehicle that China will need to make a success of that is to make the yuan a dominant currency within Eurasia. And that's what they're trying to do. It's absolutely explicit. They want to displace the American dollar in Asia. Yes, I think so. I think, I think we, we probably will see that. I mean, if you look at the history of the dollar and you look at the, at the US real exchange rate basket, which is probably a, a pretty robust benchmark, then you see that basically there have been two characteristics of the dollar over the medium term. One is an adjustment after Bretton Woods, where the real value of the dollar dropped by about a third, maybe 30, 40 percent. This was around the early 1970s. And then the, effectively the uh, real value of the dollar flatlined apart from two periods where there were spikes. Uh, one, which basically occurred under Volcker when uh, interest rates went up, when the Federal Reserve was grappling with the inflation problem, and then you saw the dollar clearly soaring through that period. And another one, which has been more recently, uh, in the course of the last three to four years. And basically what you see after those periods is the dollar spikes up and then comes down. So these are 30, 40 percent moves upwards, and then 30, 40 percent moves downwards. And if you look at it symmetrically, we should be in that downward adjustment phase now. Never say never, of course, but that's what we were, we were expecting. Now, in a way, that is the way that the American economy, Phoenix-like, reinvents itself, where US manufacturing comes back and effectively, uh, you know, President Trump squares the circle. And he appeals to the sort of voters that voted him in, the manufacturing belt of the US. Essentially, that gets economic revival. And in many ways, I mean, the parallel is always a very dangerous one, but this is probably the closest one could say to Margaret Thatcher in the UK in the early 1980s. This is after all what she did. I don't want to you know, sound that, that gloomy, but clearly there is a risk. And I think that, you know, the issue is that the, the, the whole uh, sort of polarity, if you like, of the Western financial system has been reversed. And that's creating a problem. And it's a problem that the, the central banks, we don't think, fully understand. I mean, they've clearly got up to speed in the last, or somewhere up to speed in the last 10 years after the financial crisis. But ultimately what you saw, the real problem the world got into, was that uh, corporations in the West, which were traditionally borrowers from the banking system, suddenly became lenders back to it. And the banks didn't know what to do with the funds, and so they found sort of spurious uses like uh, you know, US uh, housing or whatever, uh, or bad US housing to lend to, and that ultimately caused the crisis. Now, um, what we've got to look for in the future is to try and restore the normal cre credit mechanism in the West. We've got to get returns on capital up, and we've got to get the economy functioning in a normal way. And I think that, you know, quite frankly, austerity policies just don't do it. Uh, what you need is, broadly speaking, whether people like it or not, is some sort of spending program, rather like we've got going on in China, to actually lift the West out of this uh, slow growth environment. 
So I think you want some gold in portfolios. I mean, that has to be a sensible insurance strategy. I think the euro is a likely candidate for appreciation. So I'd start to look at the euro currency, not euro stocks, but the euro currency. Uh, the dollar, I wouldn't, wouldn't be holding the US dollar right now because I think that's the vehicle where you get most of the adjustment. Uh, the yen you could think about, but then I made the case that I think the yen will more likely move with the dollar. I think in terms of Asian stocks, China is clearly one to look at uh, very, very seriously. Uh, you can still buy in the US market a lot of uh, closed-end funds for China at sizable discounts, so that's certainly worth looking at. Look around the region for you know the next beneficiaries of the China Belt and Road Initiative. Look at Vietnam. Vietnam, I think, is primely placed uh, to be a key beneficiary in the next few years. Uh, so I'd be looking at those kind of areas. Um, and then I think the other thing, which may be a slightly maverick view, is take a look at the fixed income. Now, although it may be a slightly wonkish comment, you can make money out of fixed income in this environment. Uh, you roll the futures, uh, the carry is going up the whole time. Uh, there, there are strategies that you can make money in fixed income. It's a relatively safe asset. We do a lot of it ourselves in, in the treasury market in the US. Just do a, uh, just roll, just do a duration target and roll it. Uh, you can make pretty decent money out of it. Well, I think the thing is that if I go back and I sort of wear my, my Salomon Brothers hat, one of the things that we did a little research on in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, was essentially sequencing and volatility. And what you see is that volatility tends to start out in the fixed income markets, it spreads out towards the forex markets, and then it starts to hit the equity markets maybe six or so months later. So I think if you look at sequencing and volatility, that's a, that's a good heads up. The, the great problem with risk parity is that the fundamental thing it ignores is, is correlation, underlying correlation structures. And basically, uh, you know, ultimately, the benchmark asset we've all got to look at, or benchmark we've all got to look at when we're investing is inflation. And basically, if you look at the three big asset classes, uh, equities, fixed income, and let's say real assets, commodities, what you find is that the behavior of fixed income and commodities relative to inflation is actually absolutely predictable. So it's a, effectively a straight line. So if you start to see inflation going up, fixed income sell off, commodities do a lot better, or real assets do better. Look at equities, the response is very different. It's asymmetric. So basically what you find is that the highest equity valuations do not occur at high or lo very low inflation rates. They occur at sort of moderate inflation rates. So the equity valuation curve against inflation looks like a bell curve. And that's what makes it very difficult. Now, if you envision that picture, what it will tell you is that's where risk parity goes wrong because it assumes that the equity response is a linear one. It's not. It's nonlinear. So effectively, at very low rates of inflation, what you find is equity and bond markets are negatively correlated, hence the risk parity model. At higher rates of inflation, and we may be moving towards higher rates of inflation, they become very positively correlated. So if fixed income sell off, equities become toast. And one of the things to watch is the oil market, because that normally imparts a big cyclical pressure, certainly on US inflation. I think one of the things that we have learned very clearly in the last couple of decades is that, very sadly, Milton Friedman's wrong. And that is that inflation is not always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It's a cost phenomenon about the real economy. And China has taught us that uh, you know, in spades. Now, where money matters is in the financial markets. And you could say financial asset price inflation is always and everywhere uh, a monetary phenomenon. And that's that's the takeaway. Well, I think what's, what's going to matter very clearly, the two things that we have our eyes very, very closely pinned on, is number one, the US dollar. Okay, What's going to happen to the dollar? Does it basically sink here? Uh, or does it sort of very gradually fade off? And that's really the key question for financial market risk. Uh, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, we're watching it very closely. We suspect that you will get a sell-off in the dollar later on this year, but who knows? Second thing is the People's Bank of China. That's absolutely critical. We need to know whether the monetary tap is open or closed in China. I suspect it's going to stay open, but I've been wrong before.